I should like to begin by asking Secretary Kissinger why he thought to give President Nixon to read a one-volume edition of Spengler's Decline of the West. Oh, because uh, I had discussed the, uh, my early interest in philosophy of history with President Nixon. And uh, I pointed out to him that I thought that Spengler, with many of whose conclusions I didn't agree, nevertheless in his perception of uh, the rise and fall of civilizations as integrated units, that is to say, in which politics, art, architecture, science were all part of the same perception that that was an interesting way of looking at the problem of civilization, not necessarily a prediction of our civilization. Well, did you expect that he would learn uh, to see more acutely what was happening to our civilization simply by mastering Spengler's technique or by uh, sharing in Spengler's Weltschmerz? Well, first of all, I think it is incorrect to say that Spengler uh, suffered from Weltschmerz. I think that what Spengler attempted to do is to show that civilizations follow a certain rhythm and a certain sequence of events, and it is therefore wrong to say <coughs> it's optimistic or pessimistic. It is more important to understand whether his perception uh, had some validity. The reason, however, that I uh, discussed this with President Nixon was to emphasize that the manifestation of events which come up in the form of tactical decisions are very often quite misleading, and that a statesman has to understand what the trend of events is, whether it is in a positive or in a negative direction, and has to understand that there are many seemingly unrelated manifestations of a total culture that affect the scope of policy and the direction that it can take. Well, but it's I also was much less interested in the predictions of Spengler than in his perception. Than, than in his technique. Besides, he had read Toynbee, so I had to give him another road. Well, th there's, a certain, there's a certain irreversibility, isn't there, in uh, Sp Spengler's view of things, which I take it you did not want to suggest to the president I don't believe that there's an irreversibility in events, <coughs> but I do believe that to reverse a trend requires more than proclamations, it and it is important to understand what the trend is before one can reverse it. Well, I think, I think uh, most people would agree, although sometimes trends are accidentally reversed, even by people who fail to understand them, uh, isn't that, just as they are unintentionally accelerated. Yes, but if you make policy, you cannot do it in the expectation of a miracle or of an accidental reversal. The problem of policy making is to get some conscious control over events. Now, if an accident helps you, you're, ex you're lucky. But you cannot conduct affairs on the basis of the expectation of winning at roulette. No, but, but doesn't the making of policy sometime, sometimes call simply for the buying of safe time? I remember when Mr. Churchill, speaking in 1949 at MIT, perhaps you were there, uh, said that uh, perhaps the, the death, he didn't name him, but his allusion was clearly to Stalin, uh, would uh, give to the West the same advantages that the death of Genghis Khan uh, gave us. And there is a sense in which uh, a, a policy can be understood as hoping things will change for the better, meanwhile simply playing it as safe as you can. Is that correct? Sometimes you have to play for time uh, in the expectation of some change such as the one to which Churchill referred. Uh, but to the extent possible, there has to be some rational explanation of what you're waiting for. You cannot simply conduct policy waiting for a favorable accident. But it was a perfectly rational expectation that the death of Stalin would bring about 
important domestic changes in the Soviet Union, and therefore playing for that time was a reasonable course of action.